to open source in games. If you're in the wrong presentation, that's on you. You clicked the wrong link. You should stay a while anyway. Hi, Roddy Kiley here, Principal Messaging Engineer at Red Hat. Hi, my name is Derek Reese, and I am a Principal Software Engineer at Red Hat, and I'm also a founding member of the Gaming Community of Practice. I'm Jared Sprague, Principal Software Engineer at Red Hat. Today we're going to talk a little bit about what open source even is, how can you use it, how do you make an impact with it on production at your studio, and some resources that you can use today along with how to get involved with them. So what is open source? Open source isn't the same flavor it used to be. 20 years ago, when I started contributing to the open source community, we were rascals, raconteurs, troublemakers, communist socialists, you name it. Some guy at Microsoft famously called Linux a cancer. It's an open source operating system, and it was all because of this absolutely crazy notion that software source code should be freely available to use, view, modify, and share. And we'd all be a little better for it. At the surface level, that's what open source is. And funny enough, a little company called Red Hat was founded on that idea 10 years prior. Normally, when we at Red Hat talk about open source, we talk about things like IT transformation and modernization and the open organization. But like I said, open source just isn't what it used to be. Nowadays, it's ubiquitous. Most of the Fortune 500 relies on open source software in some manner or another. It's enterprise, it's standard, but it's also more powerful, sustainable, and faster paced than ever. Whether you know it or not, open source projects have been a hallmark of the game industry for decades. The free BSD OS behind Sony and Nintendo's latest consoles, the core curl and web libraries that make our multiplayer services function, open source is how we do things. But that's where we as an industry hit a bit of a wall, because open source means a great deal more than just source code. It also means things important to the business side of game development, such as avoiding vendor lock-in and better key data points to decision making. It reduces barriers to hiring and retaining the best talent for your studio. And it's much more engaging to work on quote unquote routine infrastructure bits when there's a community alongside your engineers every step of the way. Companies like Ubisoft, for example, have gotten fully behind open source software or OSS from sponsoring Blender Development Fund along with Epic Games to directly contributing plugins and tools on their GitHub. EA has even contributed game-oriented SDL, WebKit, and QT forks on top of multiple talks and presentations on their approach. The ideologies and benefits of open source don't need to stop there at the bowels and foundations of our games and interactive experiences. Sometimes, all it takes is the right conversation to unlock the principles that make open source so compelling. One of those biggest hurdles to implementing the advantages of open source in your game pipelines is how confusing the ecosystem can seem for newcomers. There are a lot of discussions around terms that give developers high blood pressure, like licensing, distribution, attribution, and legality. The good news is we can absolutely oversimplify that a bit for you. Basically, if it's a GPL licensed product, don't ship it with your game, because the GPL license requires dependent source code to be available. In an open source game, absolutely fine. But most use cases are for things like Blender, GIMP, Git, MySQL, which we'll talk about those more later, and they shouldn't be bundled with the game. Your fans can just download those projects themselves, so no big deal there. If you want to ship like an export script for Blender with your engine, just ship it separately online as available download. Almost every other popular open source license though, like MIT or Apache, commonly used for software libraries and tools, is good to go. Just pop a license in the root folder your game distributable, or if you're feeling super generous, you can toss the license at the end of your game credits. I know people love to read those. There are exceptions, of course, but most of them can be resolved with a quick search online and are not impossible to vet through your legal department since there are case proofs available on almost every license. My personal favorite, though, is the do what the you want to public license, which is about as complicated and erudite as it sounds. Frankly, the first step to making open source a bigger part of your workflow and all the benefits alongside that is remembering to search that stuff up when you're looking at a problem or a new development in your game pipeline. Just adding the words open source to your query can make a world of difference in discovering tools that can get you closer to your potential solutions much, much faster. The next step though, is about identifying the healthy bits of the project. Check the date stamp on the last commit in the repo, compare it to the roadmap and other related projects. 
This and some other indicators that you can see here on the slide are the project maturity. See if there are larger companies like Red Hat that offer paid support for security audits, consulting, and implementation services with employees in the project's leadership roles. An enterprise company guaranteeing results also generally guarantees a large variety of choice for partners should you and your team decide that you need it, which means expanded community and infrastructure. You can also dip into the Discord or other active communications channels to see if recent questions are being answered. Even if the project isn't as popular or supported, it may still be worth investigating. Maybe your team can adopt the project via a GitHub issue, or you can fork it and pick and choose which things sync up with your workloads and goals. Of course, the best thing for your team and the community at large is to engage at multiple levels, from small source code contributions to the big leaks like documentation and building roadmaps. Creating a larger impact at your studio with open source is as easy and as difficult as showing a coworker a new tool and, you know, convincing IT it won't sell out your game's source code. Thankfully, most studios these days have at least one open source expert in their IT department. And if not, it's a pretty reasonable request to get one or contract an expensive help from a company specializing in open source software. The other half of the problem is much harder because it's one of those what we call people problems. Open source isn't just freely available repos on GitHub. It's also the idea that we'd make it a lot further every time we shoot our moonshot if we collaborated and even communicated with other people. For a lot of us in the game industry, that may not be our management's natural inclination, but let's face it, it's why we're here. The creative energy from artists working with engineers learning from fans is this endless cycle that keeps us going even in the face of the odd you know, toxic environment or poor press reception. Building an open source community inside your studio takes effort, time, and people skills. There's no two ways about it. Even at Red Hat, the open source company, we put considerable time and effort into helping coworkers learn the open source way and become comfortable with it as a workflow of contributing back and benefiting from a worldwide community. Part of it is that it is intimidating. There are literally billions of people on this planet, many with access to these projects and the ability and time to contribute, and not all of them are quite like the people at your studio. Having a strong support system is vital to building a new feature to ship with your game. And of course, open source is no different. Pivoting to an ecosystem where parts of your day-to-day -day are open is inviting vulnerability, and that's a scary thing. Most importantly though, your open source development community is here for you. We've all struggled through the same barriers, conversations, and even process updates. There's an instinctive tribal need among humans to connect, and open source is a meaningful way for us game developers to do that. There's a process I like to follow personally when I find a project that I think could work well for your studio. It's a bit like the scientific method. Step number one, the hypothesis, is clearly state and identify the problem you're trying to solve. This could be something that personally affects you or something that could benefit the whole studio. Step two is to build out both your success and failure identifiers. It's perfectly okay to prove that an open source tool just isn't the right fit at this time for your pipeline. And that's a really useful thing to learn. Just by starting the discussion, you may get answers and support from the community for your next project. Step three is to figure out a timeline for getting to your success and failure states. When I'm trying out a new project, I'll introduce milestones to the team to build confidence in the introduction of a new tool or library to the ecosystem. Step four, engage the community. Let them know, at least up to an NDA, right? What sorts of exciting things you and your team plan on doing. You may find others that are working through the exact same sorts of challenges and goals. And of course, step five, share what you've learned. Be upfront with your team that you want to do a post-mortem or that the benefits can even be greater by sharing those learnings back to the open source community via maybe the Project GitHub Discord forum or a mailing list. There are plenty of opportunities for open source to change things up for your studio, for your studio starting today. So let me hand it over to Roddy. Thanks, Derek. Now we're going to cover open source resources that you can use today. We'll briefly cover the boring, move on to the well-established, the underpinning, and finally the comprehensive and freshly minted. Project management. First off, the boring, the mundane, but also as mentioned, setting a timeline is an important part of completing any project, including a game. Breaking down the big picture into manageable chunks and ensuring that each of the art, audio, business, and code team members understand where you are and where you're going is essential to any game development project. 
Of course, if you're an in indie, you may be wearing more than one of those hats. But even in a more well-established studio, Redmine can serve as a compelling choice to plan the work and work the plan. The coder in me particularly likes the repository integration, allowing a browser-based view of your Git repository, if you have one of your own, as well as the built-in wiki for planning things like attending GDC. Content creation. For content creation, I'll mention a few that even as a coder in the team, I've needed more than a passing use of. I'll cover those that I've been using with great success for many years and touch on others that I'm aware of. Let's start with the big three for game developers, and by that I mean the trifecta of Blender, Inkscape, and GIMP, which allow you to cover 3D and video composition, as well as 2D vector and raster graphics, respectively. Blender. Historically well known as a powerful and feature-rich 3D creation suite, and certainly having its own unique learning curve, in the recent past it has underwent the GUI makeover, focusing on ease of use, as well as the integration of new rendering technology. For those who need more customization than provided out of the box, it features sophisticated Python scripting to allow it to better fit your own workflow. Backed by the Blender Foundation, which is a member of both the Open Invention Network, whose mission is to enable open source, as well as the Linux Foundation, which is helping open technology projects build world-class open source software communities and companies. The foundation is well aligned with Red Hat, where we believe using an open development model helps create more secure, stable, and innovative technologies. Inkscape. As Blender has you covered for the manipulation of all things vector in 3D, Inkscape has you covered for vector graphics and illustration in 2D. While only recently mincing the official version 1.0 in 2020, and now at version 1.1, it has a long history of usefulness tracing back to 2003. Since that time, it has made great progress and is well worthy of the recently added version 1.1. As you can see from the screenshot above, it was and is useful for a variety of SEG creation, import, export, and manipulation workflows. As with Blender, if the supported workflow isn't available out of the box, you can script it in a language such as Python. GIMP, or the GNU Image Manipulation Program, has been a go-to image editor for some time, with a development history which dates back to 1995. As shown in the screenshot, it was recently used as a part of the Podescape art pipeline, where it enabled us to take the raw raster assets and size them appropriately for being rendered as sprites in-game. To be honest, as a coder, I mostly only scratched the surface of what GIMP is capable of, doing relatively straightforward things. That being said, it is also extensible via Python. And while relative newcomers such as Krita have focused more on digital painting than image manipulation, in the hands of the right artist, GIMP remains a powerful production tool in its own right. Audacity. Having covered the big three for 3D, 2D vector and raster, I would be remiss if I also didn't at least touch upon audio. Here, open source also has communities that are relevant to the game developer and the content creation pipeline. One such project, Audacity, allows you to record, manipulate, and produce sounds. Here we see a raw WAV file as originally used for an intro sound. Now, having briefly touched on essential open source resources for either all disciplines, such as Redmine, or other disciplines, such as the Big Three plus Audacity, I'd now like to talk about some immediate concerns as a game coder. Having briefly touched on essential open source resources for either all disciplines, such as Redmine, or other disciplines such as the Big Three plus Audacity, I'd now like to talk about some immediate concerns as a game coder. Libraries, SDKs, engines, and other tools. Isaac Newton is credited with saying, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And nowhere is this probably more true than in the field of software development. Every day in my work on messaging, building containers, or on the recently announced Linux Foundation Open 3D Engine project, I use countless open source tools from the window manager, the terminal, the shell, the terminal multiplexer, the text editor, and on and on. In open source, we get to see further, not necessarily because we are individually better, 
but because we collaboratively build upon each other's efforts. Essentials. We have APIs that come from reference standards such as OpenAL, OpenGL, and more recently Vulkan, which bring us full circle back to 3DFX Glide days, but in a fully and open standard way. When you need to write code to work with audio and video in your game, the MP3 compression alternative Og Borbus, or that compressed option FLAC may fit the bill. Open source is all about choice, however, and the FFmpeg multimedia framework states that they have you covered if you are looking for a comprehensive solution that can decode, encode, transcode, mux, demux, stream, filter, and play pretty much anything that humans and machines have created. For rendering, if you are looking for a compact, web-friendly, C-based project, then maybe SoCal is your choice. If C++ is preferable, then its sibling Oreo might be a better choice for you. Want the web native with JavaScript? Phaser 3 is possibly for you. And dear I am GUI, which is a minimalist GUI implementation useful in native code, JavaScript, and compiled WebAssembly, or WASM. Depending on the type of game that you're making, you might need a physics simulation. If so, check out Box2D for your 2D physics needs, or Bullet Physics for 3D. Both of these projects are well established with prior industry impact and are good choices. And in fact, Box2D served as the basis for the original Unity 2D physics implementation. And as well, we see that NVIDIA with its physics implementation has gone from commercial to open source in recent years. Now, as cool and as great as all those libraries, SDKs, engines, and tools are to any developer, we also know that development today doesn't end at the edges of the box on the desk. There are full stack developers for a reason. We have upstream, midstream, downstream, in the cloud, on the web, in containers, which can all be orchestrated by Kubernetes. With an open upstream first, operate first philosophy, Red Hat is well acquainted with emerging technologies at many of those levels. Starting at the back end, we have the Agons project, which is great if you're trying to cloudify an existing monolithic game server, or Nakama if you are looking to deploy distributed game services on the back end, such as user authentication, social networking, storage, and real-time data exchange. Deserving of honorable mention are our open source toolchain and open standard pipeline components, with a special call out to the Eclipse Che, which is great if you have developers want to work for the web in a web native integrated development environment. And speaking of integrated development environments, whether it be something like the cloud native Eclipse Che or the more traditional Visual Studio Code, Xcode or C-Line, where all coding tasks from text editing through compilation, linking and testing are brought together into a cohesive whole, game development environments have certainly entered the mainstream. Many game engines available today, like the Coders IDE, bring together a game-specific asset pipeline, editor, and binary builder. Open source has good choices for these game development environments, and in particular, we are going to talk about the previously referenced Godot engine and the newly minted Linux Foundation's Open3D engine. The Godot engine is billed as the game engine you waited for, and having experience building and releasing games in Unity, I really enjoyed using Godot when we were building Pod Escape last year. Having a background in animation tooling, I really appreciated its node-based architecture, which you can see here under the Scene tab in the upper left of the screenshot. And although the mono support was essentially tech preview, we were able to utilize C Sharp, yet export to the web via WebAssembly to deploy at podescape.io. It is multi-language, however, with its own built-in scripting, GD script, as well as supporting C++ and C Sharp. To see how we've been using Godot here at Red Hat, be sure to check out colleague Luke Derry's talk, Godot for the Enterprise, from GodotCon 2021. Last, but certainly not least, is the freshly minted, newly announced, Linux Foundation's Open3D Engine, a new upstream, community-based project that is the next generation and open successor 
to the Amazon Lumberyard AAA game tech. The engine is a mix of mature game technology, including a fully featured IDE with visual scripting system, proven technology such as Lua integration for more rapid iteration, as well as existing open source technologies such as a CMake based build system and a GitHub based CI CD pipeline. Concepts such as the integrated entity component system, along with the ease of using just what you need via the modular gem system, mean that the developer gets to build upon a minimalist foundation for their specific type of game, rather than being required to fit the mold or retrofit and refactor. As a messaging engineer, I particularly appreciate the recently rewritten multiplayer netcode gem, which includes entity replication, local prediction, and server-side backward reconciliation. This replaces the original legacy gridmate networking system with a less rigid approach that is not authoritative client-server specific. Other gems of interest are those for physics and rendering, including one for the nearly ubiquitous now Dear I Am GUI library mentioned earlier. As we can see through the gem configuration screenshot above, this also includes a focus on cloud integration not necessarily found elsewhere. While in the screenshot, a gem specific to AWS integration is selected, any cloud provider's authentication and authorization could be implemented, such as the one, for example, for the Upstream Community Keycloak project for single sign-on. We do anticipate that the community will leverage the modular architecture to collaborate on features outside of what is standard in the Yoki system, bringing both diversity and innovation. With that, over to Derek for some bigger picture thoughts on how these technicalities will translate into industry impact. Thanks so much, Roddy. We're extremely excited to be founding members of the O3DE project under the Linux Foundation here at Red Hat. Freeing studios from vendor lock-in is a huge benefit of open source, but O3DE in particular, with its modular design and open source philosophy driving all the development and community aspects, makes it a great showcase for the game industry. Collaborating with our partners such as Amazon and other game studios, we've really seen much faster and much bigger and brighter innovation together, especially where the friction of a licensed product isn't a cause for concern. We've also seen open source spread ideas from multiple industries much quicker than proprietary software, from high performance messaging queues in the finance industry to the universal scene descriptor file format from the film industry. Here, community consensus drives development, not just the agendas of business sales teams. Where there's community consensus, there's also plenty of ways to get involved with said community. Jared? Thanks, Derek, and hello, everybody. I'm Jared Sprague, and I'm going to talk to you a bit about getting involved with open source game development tools and communities and some events that we offer. So the first event is a game jam and you have probably heard of game jams before I'm sure many of you have even participated in game jams open jam is a game jam that's sponsored by Red Hat that it has an open source focus so the only rule of open jam is that your game is shipped with an open source license and that the source code be available that is the only rule of open jam um, you can even use any tools that you want or engines that you want to, to submit your games. Um, there's no restriction on that at all. The, however, you c get credited open source karma points when you do choose a, an open source tool because it's a great way for getting your hands dirty with some of these new tools. It's also a great way to just learn about open source in general because, like I said, one of the only rules is... Um, you know, you open source license your game, you have to put the source code out. Um, so you're getting, you're, if you've not uh, participated in open, uh, open source as a process, you learn some of the very basics of open source development. This year's Open Jam is October 1st through the 4th, uh, 2021. It's a virtual event, so it's all online. Um, it's a weekend, basically, you have 80 hours to create and submit your game. If you would like to register, just openjam.io. The best ones are put into rotation of the Red Hat Open Source Arcade. Uh, this, this is a screenshot from last year's 
open source summit. All right, the next thing I'm going to talk about is a brand new jam that we're very excited about that we are uh, partnering with uh, the O3DE Foundation. And when I say we, I mean uh, Red Hat. We are um, helping to host the very first O3DE jam, which is going to be a game jam based around the brand new engine that open source engine that was announced um, during GDC. And uh, this is going to be really cool because it's going to be um, a, a rare opportunity to be one of the very first people to make a game for a brand new open source game engine um, and have it seen and rated and, um, and you know, maybe, in, uh, you know, it also might go into the open source arcade. Um, but this, uh, so it's a really exciting opportunity um, and a, a rare rare uh doesn't come around very often that a brand new engine comes out and you can be one of the first people to build the game for it um so the dates of this is this is a month-long jam it's a longer than open jam because it's a new engine and it's um and it's a you know a fully featured 3d engine there's we want to give people time to um acclimate to it uh get learn it understand it um Join that jam is there in the slides. It's uh, run on itch.io um, and slash jam o3de dash jam dash 2021. So yes, you can register now. Go ahead and uh, go over there and just click the sign up button if you want to join. <laughs> um, I would love to see you there. All right, and here are some other open source game events um, that, that are very worth calling out. So open source summit is happening September uh, 27th through the 30th in Seattle. Um, and O3DE will also have a presence there. Um, O3ED Con at KubeCon, October 12th through the 15th. Um, and I put a link to O3DE.org as well as their Discord so you can find out more information about that. Um, join the Discord, join the community. Also, very, very worth mentioning is the GitHub Game Off Jam, which is a yearly jam just like Open Jam that happens uh, every November, the month of November. And this is a, a very good, this is very, it's very similar to Open Jam, actually. It's where they, you're not in required to use open source stuff, but open source tools is highly encouraged. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a great, very popular open source game jam. Um, and then there's also a monthly Godot Wild Jam. This happens every month. Um, and I put the link there. This is a great way of uh, trying out Godot if you'd like to try out another open source game engine. And with that, I will turn it back to Derek. Thank you. Thanks, Jared, so much. At Red Hat, we put our money where our mouth is. I'm not here to sell you on the Red Hat portfolio. The products can speak for themselves. I just think it's important to point out that we're not only advocating open source for our friends and partners. We're living out the open organization ourselves by both building on open source, as well as contributing back to the open source community through advocacy, code contributions, leadership, and then of course, paid support. There's a motivation here behind teaching people about open source. It's not just our business model. It's about community about building things together, and about being part of something bigger and more substantial that raises the tide for all of the boats. We'd like to take this opportunity to invite you to be a part of this community. And if you're here already, take the next step. We'll have a list of resources on our GDC landing page and at the end of this slide deck. Especially take a minute to check out O3DE and join the jam later this year. Also, be a part of Open Jam. Beat our scores and view the source code on arcade.redhat.com or duke it out with our corporate esports association teams and your favorite multiplayer game. And then of course, email us to collaborate with their engineers and product owners to build the next generation of game industry tools and infrastructure. When you make the choice not to just build with open source, but to engage the mindset behind that open decision-making, you're unlocking the potential of a larger global community, both inside and outside the games industry, that can support you and your team in building and delivering what you're good at, experiences that fans love and that stay with you throughout their lives. Thanks so much for spending time with us today. Have a great GDC.